So I, I would like to say um, how wonderful it is to be back here. I think for me it's about the fourth time to Marxism. It's a most wonderful event. It's tremendous to see such a wide range of human beings, of humanity, of comrades and friends. And I find it very invigorating. And with some of the comrades who have been involved in the event here, who now teach out in South Africa, um, we've actually got together and begun to do something a little similar on a rather modest basis. But what you do here germinates elsewhere. And we've had two very successful events. One was the centenary of the Russian Revolution, and the other one was the bicentenary of a certain Karl Marx. Um, right, you can give, give applause to that. What I'm confounded by, and bitterly disappointed John Rose, by the way, I have been trying to see a film called The Young Marx for the last year. I've been Googling it to find that it's not showing in London until I realized from the blessed program that it's actually showing at 8 o'clock tonight. <laughs> so I'll have to sacrifice that. Uh, let me, in making the announcements, Comrade Chair, also say that in this very room after this event at 8 p.m., not 8, 7, at 9 p.m., 9 p.m., uh, we having a full... 8.45 at 8.45, 8.45, we're having a preview, well, a trailer, actually, of a film that's in the progress of being made on that book up here called London Recruits, edited by Ken Keeble, who's somewhere here with us. And come along to that if you can. It's actually quite unique. Now, what that film shows is how, as far back as the late 1960s, Ripley's Believe It or Not wouldn't have this, or you wouldn't believe it, but it was an occasion when so-called, and I'm saying so-called because I don't like these terms, Stalinists and Trotskyists combined together to help the ANC run uh, and smuggle literature into South Africa. They were able to do that. I recruited these guys out of not just London, but around Britain and elsewhere, and they all went in secretly. It's like a long time later that we had the first reunion with the likes of George Pazes and, and John Rose here and Ken Keeble over there, Pete Smith and other YCLers. And of course they were all astounded to suddenly see these bloody trots on the one side of the room and these bloody Stalinists on the other. We have reunions every year, and this film is absolutely unique, not just for that. That's a, a, a side issue. It's about the international support in a clandestine manner. But let's get into South Africa after Jacob Zuma. Most people in the world now know the name Jacob Zuma. Um, Cyril Ramaphosa, who has succeeded him, has come to the fore in a blaze of headlines and glory and hopes and optimism and termed the new change in South Africa as a new dawn. So I want to look at that um, in, 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 in this 30 minutes or so. Um, but to understand what's going on in a country that back in 1990 and 94, and it wasn't just the Man Mandela iconic effect, it was the years of agonized, bloody struggle against that hated apartheid racist capitalist system that was finally overcome. And um, the beginning took place in terms of creating a new democratic, non-racist, non-sexist South Africa. And I was part of this. I was actually part of the Mandela government from the beginning. 
and lasted for 14 years from him to Mbeki and then resigned when a putsch took place which uh, supplanted Mbeki by Jacob Zuma. Um, so really to try and give you some idea about these rather bizarre, extraordinary events in a country that most of you, I would say, all your lives have been attached to and followed and supported that struggle, um, how to make sense of a very complicated situation that's developed and what are the prospects for the future given that in 1990 when the ANC, Communist Party, Pan-Africanist Congress, etc. were unbanned, Mandela and numerous others released from lifelong uh, prison sentences, <laughs> um, people began to feel that a revolution could possibly take place in South Africa. I certainly did and I've been involved from 1960 was a very optimistic time. So looking back then, for a, a little bit casting our minds back at key um, decisions that the Mandela government took, one does so in order to begin to understand the dynamism and the chemistry of South Africa and what has happened to turn what appeared to be a fantastic new beginning into something uh, that people are actually extremely disappointed with. And a lot of people in South Africa, especially young people, are tending to say that Mandela was a sellout uh, and so were his associates, etc. Um, we'll try and examine that. It's going to be, and it will cast a little bit of a pessimistic picture because one's got to be realistic in the world we're living in with its complexities, its setbacks and the like about what is possible and more and more I've come to realize, and it's not just me, I, I'm not a unique thinker by any means um, that South Africa actually reflects so much of what you're going through in Britain and about what people elsewhere are going through. A lot of the hopes that were dashed, a lot of the problems being faced. We don't have right-wing white racism, of course, to speak of in South Africa in terms of Trump and uh, his lookalikes in Europe and elsewhere, but there is a very sad aspect of identity politics in South Africa now. And with young people, um, and this is where I would say the government of South Africa failed miserably in conveying through an educational curricula the history of struggle, that class analysis never mind the word socialism, is actually out the window. And like so many other countries, it tends to be overtaken by identity politics. And a lot of the young people in frustration and rebellion against the older generation and those they feel have failed them, from Mandela and Mbeki through to Zuma and even the new dawn man, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, are shunning the kind of conventional liberation politics and are looking for other avenues and increasingly amongst them is a race factor. I'm not calling them racist as such, but there's certainly populism, there's uh, demagogic aspect, there's the persistent um, approach of, uh, of looking at things through the race lens. And amongst socialists of a whole range, and this is a very positive 
factor, which I'm going to end on, to lift your spirits uh, from the pessimism at, at the beginning, is that there, there is new light on the horizon. And socialists of all grades, from the communists to Maoists um, to Trotskyists, using these kind of words, a tendency of a coming together and a view that what is so essential is to advocate for socialism for a class analysis and that becomes such a vital element in the whole education and struggle process. But I want to just draw attention to some of the failings of coming to power as we did after centuries of struggle against colonialism under the Dutch and then the Brits and then the 48 or so years of apartheid racism and of course people in South Africa will refer to the racist capitalist system. Are, are, are you all hearing me? Um, the, the racist capitalist system. Um, that in fact the key thing then is, well let me say rather the, the, the key element to understand is that with the change in 1990 what was the perspective and where did mistakes arise and in terms of this it's a centenary of Mandela's birth there are the usual, both in South Africa and here in Westminster and around the world, uh, Barack Obama has just been in South Africa to give a major lecture on Mandela. And, uh, you know, he and Obama are referred to more or less in the same voice. Um, certainly, there's this deification of Mandela, the man who's regarded as a saint and who said, I'm not a saint, I'm just a product of the struggle. Um, maybe, in fact, from my point of view, I don't think he was that modest a person. But he was an, a, an incredible human being, to be sure. So, look, in brief, what occurs is that by 1990, there's an international situation, collapse of the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall. There's huge economic problems for the apartheid system and its desire and corporate capitalism's uh, uh, desire to bring South Africa out of the cold and part of the world economy. Um, apartheid had fallen because of the mass struggle of the people of South Africa, reinforced by our underground and our military activity and international solidarity. So essentially, um, de Klerk, the reformist from the apartheid party gets the message, the writing on the wall and Washington and London and, and uh, Paris etc. are all saying your time is now. Unless you make the concessions there's going to be the red revolution and the time is now because those blasted commies from the other side of the wall no longer exist so the idea that Moscow is going to come with the ANC and take the country over, which is the propaganda of apartheid for all those years, which of course was balderdash, but they're saying this is really the time to make the change and hand over an aspect of, of political power. So it's an incredible new situation. It, it rocks the world back on its heels, including us. Uh, we we imagine we would come to power through an armed mass insurrection of the people. Um, there's this change, and one needs to understand it at the time. With it goes the very strong caveat from South African big business, the corporates, the Oppenheimers, the Ruperts, the the, the 0.1% of the world's um, richest who are making sure that they're going to use their influence to prevent the ANC 
changing the economic course of the country, except in certain minor degrees. And really on the table, and this was made apparent to us by Mandela after he visits Davos in 1992, and he comes back and he says to us, look guys, um, big business, the leaders around the world and not just the West. I've spoken to the Cubans, he says, and the Chinese, etc. And they're saying, don't make the mistake of nationalizing everything. You'll be isolated. And he says, certainly from big business, it's clear we won't get any investment if we pursue a radical socialist course, which in a vague way is uh, expressed in our Freedom Charter. A sort of bourgeois national democratic revolutionary document where the banks and the mines uh, and, and, and big industry would be nationalized and land redistributed. That's put on the back burner. And why? Because Mandela and in discussion with our trade union leadership, Communist Party, the ANC, and of course he, he is the driver of the bus. And I can tell you, nobody wants to fall out with Mandela. Not for personal reasons, but like Joe Slova would say to me, Ronnie, if we fall out with Mandela, the unity of this alliance goes and it's going to set us back. It's just recently that I read a wonderful interview with Tariq Ali, talking 50 years after the uh, Le Bute do you want to show your lovely T-shirt from the 1968 Paris uprising? <laughs> and Tariq is interviewed. I think John was at World um, New Left Review. And uh, he, I, I read this most interesting interview. And he says that what um, his group discussed at the time, and not only here in Britain, but on the continent, was that there was this great search forward for revolution, that some aspects were achieved. You remember de Gaulle was sent packing and other concessions are made. And he said, we had discussions about what we called the dialectic of partial conquest. And it hit me, it hit me like a thunderbolt it's exactly what we were discussing in South Africa. We didn't use that exquisite term that he, he comes up with. But there we were, and it was this question of, do we accept this possibility now that through negotiation we will get a universal election, national election? which will bring us to power. We knew that. De Klerk and others thought maybe the ANC would get under 50%. We knew we'd get well into the upper 60s, if not 70, etc. So we knew it would mean political power in a sense. In a sense. I'll just come back to that in a minute. But certainly political control government. The question then was, what about South Africa's economy? which traditionally has been in colonial capitalist corporate hands of a very few in South Africa linked to international corporate capital. And it's Nkrumah, after all, that had long made the statement back at the time of Ghana coming to independence in 1957 that first comes the political kingdom and then all else follows. And in his view, the all else then was getting your, e your, your hands on the economic controls. And of course, that never happened. And during those decades, in our military camps in Africa and in our drawing rooms in uh, London or wherever, the question always was in Krumer's major error. They had comrades in reading of Marx. You could never have political control and not the economic. If that happens, you'll lose through a neo-colonial type process or whatever. You're going to lose 
the real political power. It's going to be watered down. So it was that kind of choice. I have in my book referred to it as a Faustian pact um, of, of accepting the political power factor and putting the economics on the back burner, thinking as we did, and we discussed this in the Communist Party, that the political controls and government would give us the time and the space and the opportunity to build up uh, the class aspects of the struggle and bring us closer step by step to, to conquering economic control. And that was the decisive discussion excuse me, and uh, decision. Well, we learned it the hard way because the chickens come home to roost. You get into that situation and for sure, in a sense, your vigilance is downplayed, aspects of the alliance weaken, the trade union movement, which was at its heart, began to weaken and to quite a degree collapse. The aspects of capitalist seduction and the seduction of posts that affect people. And in that process, policy begins to be watered down. And the masses and a leadership, a gulf, begins to widen uh, if you're not careful. And you need to learn the lessons of the Paris Commune in terms of, of that, of the right to recall your delegates, of ensuring that your delegates only receive the salary of a skilled worker and the like. And of course, those who are seducing and pulling us into that situation know too well from centuries of manipulation, centuries of experience that Albion knows probably better than any other country um, how you can undermine revolutionary fervor and unity. So there is the Mandela figure who uh, has the accolades of, of the transition to democracy, but now more and more an opprobrium that major betrayal took place. I don't believe that it was a betrayal in terms of, although I use the Faustian pact, of sitting with the devil on one side, you on the other, and a deal for this and a deal for that. But errors of political judgment abound. And that's very, very clear. So we have a situation where we came to power and we gave far too much to the corporates, to capital in South Africa. Um, we agreed that the new government would, would be responsible for paying off the apartheid debt, which was billions, in relation to the arms uh, acquisition program under apartheid because it had to have its powerful military. We agreed in terms of IMF diktat that the corporate tax under apartheid would drop from 48% to 28%, 20% down. I was shocked the other day, or, or wizened the other day, reading about the Israeli economy to discover that Israel's um, tax, corporate tax, is exactly what South Africa's is. And I then realized, my God, what we did wasn't just a thumb suck, okay, drop it to 28. That that was the norm, that's the template, that's what the IMF wanted. And we meekly went along with that. Instead of perhaps dropping a bit, but if we had had a, a, another 10% on top of that, we would have had such a war chest and certainly it's 3% our educationalists on the socialist side have worked out that would cater to free education for the poor in South Africa at tertiary level. We allowed 
the corporates in South Africa to list on the London Stock Exchange. We lifted currency exchange, which allowed them to take their billions out and receive their dividends here. And all of this has created the paltry situation of the South African economy. So very quickly, our GDP has dropped to just over zero. At one stage, it was 5% before the 2008 meltdown. Our unemployment is just short of 28%, but that actually, for young people, is something like 60%. It's a time bomb waiting to go off, like Britain, like America and other countries, going into the neoliberal global economy has meant that South African manufacturing industry in particular, textiles for instance, uh, aspects of our agriculture, um, our steel industry, have all dropped immensely with thousands and thousands of jobs going out the window. So we have, and I said, pessimistic uh, situation to talk about, we have a, a looming economic meltdown and we're paying uh, because, of course, there had to be some aspects of redistribution. You couldn't get away with nothing. And redistribution had been in terms of free basic water for the poor, electricity, housing and the like. Um, but in, in terms of this, there was also the beginnings of a welfare state, 15 million people on, on grants that keep them alive and their families fed. And it's been worked out that at the current rate in South Africa, within a couple of years, we're going to have a situation where we won't be able to pay for the grants to those 15 million of the poorest of the poor. So. We've got that kind of problem looming. Jacob Zuma comes to power in 2008 because by then the left of the alliance, so the Communist Party and the Trade Union Congress, Kusatu, are furious with Mandela to start with, but then particularly Mbeki, who's very much uh, the neoliberal thinker with a Marxist rhetoric and, and way of explaining things, who um, tends to be very standoffish. Everything okay there? Okay. Um, who, who backs off from engagement with the comrades from the alliance doesn't meet the leaders of the Communist Party, the trade unions, uh, tends to um, retreat more and more into bookish ways and becomes isolated. Uh, so people on the left want him to go and those on the right, nationalistic elements of the ANC, who have been involved more than most, in beginning to rip off the country and its wealth in terms of the patronage system, being in power, huge public uh, service, um, numbers of well over a million, they also begin to, be, be, begin to sorry, um, challenge Mbeki, okay, thanks, and, and uh, become rather fed up with him. He's, what he does not do, and they expect him to do, is use state machinery to save them from investigation in terms of illicit processes that are mounting up uh, within the state itself and within elements of private sector who are closest to the Zuma grouping. And a number of ANC officials are falling foul of this. And they unite with the other disaffected groups. And this is what led to Mbeki being recalled as president of the country in 2008, paving the way for Zuma 
to become the president. So he's been there from two, 2008 um, to, to fairly recently. It's almost 10 years, and he presides over a kleptocracy in which the state gets hollowed out. Um, he puts in people who will do his bidding. Uh, there's huge corruption that takes place in so many ways that I, I don't have time to go into, but you would have heard about this palace he builds for himself, etc. And um, it's absolutely all, all loans going in terms of, of a looter continua, a looting continua, as the, as the cartoonists have it, you see. And this is how the cartoonists depict that period. Um, so corruption really becomes rife. And the ANC face in a number of a, a national election, a vote which was nearly 70% falls to 62%. That's in the 2016, uh, 2014, oh, sorry, um, yeah, 2014 national election. And in a municipal election in 2016, it falls to 53%. So now, the, uh, the gurus, the honchos, rather, of the ANC realize they've got to get rid of Zuma to save the ANC. And he's sent packing. That's the new dawn. Cyril Ramaphosa comes in uh, by a wafer-thin majority in an ANC national elective conference and wins of nearly 4,000 delegates by 150 against the Zuma-nominated uh, candidate, and if if she, it was his former wife, had come in, the looting would have continued as before. So Ramaphosa comes in, and uh, this is the man who's a billionaire now, who presided on behalf of Lundman uh, as part of the shooting down of miners at Maracana in 2012. And uh, we've got Jim Nichol here, who's been very associated with their defense. Just put your hand up, Jim, because he's, he's going to give out a leaflet and just talk a little bit about a solidarity fund, fund that, that we've organized, that he's organizing, and others in South Africa. But Cyril comes to the fore, and it's to save the ANC, and it's also to save capital. I want to tell you that some years back, while I was still a minister of intelligence, no less, uh, it sounds like an oxymoron, but um, that's in charge of the intelligence agencies. I was told by British diplomats, uh, Ronnie, the A-team for South Africa is Jacob Zuma and Cyril Ramaphosa. So Cyril has got that association, the billionaire aspect, the Marikana background, but he's very sophisticated, he's made his money, he's unlikely to be corrupted in the Zuma sense, so take the bribes and so on. And he's got three main tasks. One, to get the ANC, okay, I'll sum up now, to get the ANC right, because it's, it's, it's rotten and the rot's gone very deep. Secondly, to ensure they win the 2019 election next year, and third, to put the state right, because it's become totally hollowed out and inefficient, uh, and, and the fourth would be to deal with the economy and put it right. Country can't come right at, at just over 0% growth. What Ramaphosa can do and, and will do and I mean, I, I hope he succeeds in this, is getting the state to function properly. We need that in any country. What Ramaphosa won't do is change the e economic trajectory. He's part of the neoliberal global economy, which has been so dire for South Africa. So that's going to be very big problems going forward. So in finality, Chair, I'd say this, that of course there are rumblings on the left. The level of consciousness, political and class in South Africa, 
is nowhere near as high as it was in the late 1980s, which was this period of incredible working class community mass struggles, and into the move towards that first election of 1994. Um, the, the levels of understanding, consciousness, etc., have really decreased for reasons linked to what I've already said. Um, however, on the left front, from within the Communist Party, certainly trade unions and particularly the National uh, 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 NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, the biggest union a new federation that's been created of almost a million workers called uh, SAFTU, the South African Federation of Trade Unions, are moving to create a new revolutionary socialist workers' party. Okay, I groaned at the title and said, oh, comrades, why don't you think of something a little bit more snappy and original, you know, like Spartacus or <laughs> such like. But that's due to be launched in late October. And that's going to begin to make changes in South Africa. But I want to indicate that that's not going to change things overnight. We have a ruling party. Uh, it, it'll get, with Ramaphosa now, it'll get back to, I would say, 60% of the vote because there is this new hope that, that has existed and the ANC has the largesse and the patronage to keep people on board. And there are good elements there as well. Communist Party was going to stand on its own, and that would have given them a great degree of popularity. But now they're making the same mistake as with Zuma. When Zuma came to the fore, oh, Comrade Ronnie, they said to me, Jacob Zuma is the best possibility for the left. It'll open space for the left. Now it's all comrades. Saul Ramaphosa is going to do the same thing. So there'll be big contradictions there. We'll leave that to question time, and then we'll find some, some time for Jim Nickel to give a presentation. Thanks very much indeed. Um, that you can't have um, a successful revolution in one country because the capitalist countries around will crush you. Okay. Closer still. Um, so, I know there are difficulties, but uh, you obviously got a really bad deal. But what I'm thinking is, um, once you realised what you'd uh, sold off too cheap, did you never think of leaving the ANC and start going back to support a grassroots, um, you know, sort of like the Maricana miners and things, and, and go back to the grassroots and, and say, well, that didn't lead where it was meant to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's not any better. For, well, or only slightly better for some people, basically. You sold, you sold the thing too cheap. Go back. Okay. Can you please also introduce yourself as well? Thanks. Uh, my name is Carl. I'm from Mayor uh, Unite, a uh, trade union. I think we're the biggest in Europe now. We used to be the biggest in Britain. But anyway, uh, well, thank you, uh, Comrade Ronnie. Put your mic a bit further from your mouth. All right. How far? Is that okay? All right, my name's Carl from Unite, the biggest trade union. In, in Britain. I think it's in Europe now. Is it too loud? But anyway, you know, I used to live in South Africa. Uh, when I was 12, I went over with my father. 1973, my father's a building worker from Liverpool. A working class family. Father's a labour supporter, trade unionist, but obviously he wasn't politicised by going to South Africa under apartheid. As a 12-year-old, all I knew about Africa was watching Tarzan films. And uh, I thought I was going to live on a game reserve. And we ended up in Joburg, which is like Ma Manhattan, very developed, 
obviously city of gold, a lot of money, a lot of history. Uh, also, I never rode to school on an elephant. I got a bus. But I was politicised there because when I went to school, uh, apartheid never told you that blacks and white were unequal at school. They were quite clever. But I was told by actually an accountancy teacher that blacks, and blacks are different than whites. But I said, I'm sorry, sir, I've got a friend in Liverpool at school, Shirley Renton, and she's black. And she's saying as me, she laughs, she cries, because he said, blacks don't taste food like us. Uh, blacks don't laugh. They don't have sense. I said, no, I'm gone. She laughs and she tastes food. Blacks are the same as us. He says, get out of my class now. You are a communist. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know what a communist was. And then he said, second from that, you're from Liverpool. And John Lennon just said, there's no God. <laughs> so I was doubly damned. Cut a long story short, 16, I went back to Liverpool on my own. And I went into my council estate and thought, God, now I am the black. You know, apartheid is a class thing. Working class, I don't meet, never met middle class peer people. I was on a council estate, like being in a township. So it clicked in my head and I ended up joining the Communist Party. So I got politicised in South Africa by the struggle. Well, what I'd like to ask, Donny, sorry, that's just a bit of a, a personal aside. What could we do as socialists and uh, progressive people in England to help South Africa at this moment in your, your period of change and development? Because I know before we helped with the, the boycott. Okay, yeah. So what can we do to help as progressives for the, uh, the struggle in South Africa? Thank you. Got a hand right at the back with the cat. Yeah. Nice hat. Thank you. <laughs> nice shirt. <laughs> My name is Baba I'm a member of the Socialist Workers League in Nigeria. Uh, thanks, Roni. Uh, but I think uh, more focus could have been on perspectives regarding uh, South Africa after Zuma. Uh, I, I find the background very useful looking at what happened with the uh, ANC 94 and all that. And uh, uh, while I, I would want to question and some intervention more on uh, possibilities after Zuma, I want to say that probably the politics of 92 to 94 was not just about Davos influence on Mandela. I, I think the politics was largely influenced by the theoretical position of a two-stage revolution, which the South African Communist Party ascribed to, and which was that for them, the aim was a national democratic revolution uh, where you gather the uh, supposedly progressive uh, national bourgeoisie, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and um, you see, Gradually, what was supposed to be a war uh, of position became a war for position. And uh, the uh, temptation of Locker also met uh, with such um, fidelity to the ideological perspective of a two-stage revolution. So, so, so I, I think um, ab initio before Davos, uh, without... Uh, Debating and uh, defeating that even within the context of the uh, colonialism of a special type, uh, it, it was almost doomed for the left. But it wasn't as if there were such debate, but the dominant uh, forces on the left. But more importantly, with regards to South Africa after Zuma, I, I, I find it a bit worrisome where, I mean, talking about the challenges being for Ramaphosa to get the state right, get the, who states? I mean, essentially, make the machine that brought down mine workers in Marikana work better, work more efficiently. Who states? And uh, regarding the, the issue of SAFTU, the issue of uh, the possibility of the party, I, I was expecting some perspective because the issue of NUMSA getting along with the establishment of a party has been known since 2013, 2014. I participated in a number of conferences uh, in that regard. And 
even the name, the Revolutionary Socialist Workers' Party thing, was adopted from like last October. It was supposed to have been launched last December. I would uh, appreciate insight from you being on ground. What I know some of the challenges Numsa has had to almost simultaneously uh, work on. Uh, bringing other forces together for a new trade union center, SAFTU. It has tried with the United Front and all that. But some of the perspectives, I questions, things I think that could be interrogated when you give feedback is, what are the possibilities for, you know, what was then called the NUMSA movement in relation now to other forces? And I, I think it's important to stress, ju just quickly, Things might not be like 1980, but 1980, in terms of consciousness, did not just fall from the blues. Before 19, before 1970, before Soweto, it seemed things were quiet. It seemed, but it is forces. What the, 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 the mass strike and demonstrations of May by Saftu showed the possibilities, showed the mass anger, showed the possibilities of organization and swings in consciousness. And I would appreciate if your subsequent uh, response interrogates these possibilities beyond the possibilities within the limits of Ramaphosa. Thank you. Um, can I have the comrade at the back with the blue shirt? Maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Right, thanks. Uh, a couple of questions. Firstly, a question from a comrade in Seville that couldn't come, but he sent a message by telegram when he saw you speaking. He said, could you tell us something about the economic freedom fighters and tell us what they're doing? Second question, I remember hearing some very worrying stories maybe two years ago now about racial attacks on migrant workers from Mozambique, um, which for some anti-racist campaigners in Europe, how, how is it possible for black people to be attacking other black people? Racism is, is complicated. And if you could tell us what's happened about that. And then finally, following on from the Nigerian comrade, uh, in Catalonia we've been having a, a lot of struggles recently around the national question. And one of the typical arguments is, First, independence, and then we'll talk about the social questions. And I think the experience you've described about South Africa is, is an example of how that doesn't work. And we've also seen an example in Catalonia of how that doesn't work, because you don't challenge the bourgeoisie and they end up selling you out. So um, I think these debates are actually very important. And if they can see there's even certain parallels between countries as different as South Africa and Catalonia, which comes back to the basic question of those from below fighting against those from above, fighting against oppression, fighting against national oppression, but always being clear that the working class has interests opposed to those of the bourgeoisie. Oh, can I come right back here, please? Thank you, Roni. Um, I'm Joshua Agbo, a member of um, Socialist Workers' Party um, from Cambridge Branch. Uh, sorry, uh, I would like to say thank you for shedding more light on how the economy of South Africa is doing today. Quite recently, we had a conference at the University of Cambridge where um, uh, Professor Benno uh, Ndulu came to give us you know, some brilliant you know, figures which were not you know, in existence in actuality. Because when I went back home, I had to read about that. And I discovered that, for instance, like talking about the life expectancy in South Africa today, um, it was Dan Bisamoyo who made me understand that it has dropped you know, uh, badly in recent times. Now, um, talking about the land question, I would like you to talk about the land question in South Africa that is going on currently. Do you think the issue is lingering on because the Truth and Reconciliation Commission wasn't fair to the people that were traumatized you know, by the apartheid regime in the past? Because as I understand, the language of the you know, Truth, uh, Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission well, is full of the language of theology, forgiveness, forgive the past. How do you forgive the past without proper treatment of how people have been traumatized you know, by the you know, um, apartheid state? And, and again, I would, like, I would like you to help us explain. Now, young people in South Africa are now beginning to accuse late Nelson Mandela that he betrayed you know, South Africa. With all his brilliant you know, quotations, wise sayings, and all of that, uh, that uh, do you think it was because of that that he was given the Nobel Peace Prize in the 90s? Do you think that it was because of that that his status was you know, built in, you know, in London here? Do you think that it was because of that that he was widely celebrated? What went wrong 
that South Africa, the, the rainbow nation that Nelson Mandela was trying to establish before his death could not happen today. Thank you. Can I um, have the comrade right here with the glasses? Right, you. Yes, sir. My name is Tony Hodges. Um, I'd like to commend to comrades um, a book uh, written um, in 2005 by Naomi Klein called Shock Doctrine, um, in which really she looks at the way that the modern world was constructed. Um, um, she, she looks at the d development of neoliberal economics that came out of the Chicago School of Hayek and Friedman, and the way that that was systematically, um, uh, uh, systematically employed throughout the, um, the, the post-war world. Um, their skills were honed in, um, after the coups in um, Indonesia in the mid-60s, in Chile in 73, and in Argentina, in Argentina in 70, 76. Um, and, and those are perhaps... That, that's what we know about um, the, the application of Chicago School economics. After a severe shock, the, the book is called The Shock Doctrine, after a severe shock like a military coup, um, the neoliberals uh, 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 walk in and, and they, um, um, they you know, dismantle the welfare state, dismantle labor organizations, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But she also looks at, um, uh, at uh, what happened in South Africa as well as what happened in Poland, what happened in, in, in Russia, and what happened in China. And um, they, they applied the, uh, um, the, same, uh, the, the same mechanisms. Just as the transition in these countries was, was happening, you got Chicago School economists coming in, talking to the, the, uh, the leaders of, 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 the, new, of the new order, um, and um, um, accompanied by people from the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. And this is what happened in South Africa, that they, they pulled members of the ANC into a meeting and they basically said, um, yeah, they basically said, look here, lads, this is how it's going to work. Um, uh, there's going to be um, no transfer of ownership of land or capital. Um, and as long as that happens, we'll continue investing and everything will be hunky-dory. But if you do apply the kind of social and economic programs you've been fighting for, we're just going to pull the rug from underneath you. And I think that explains a little bit uh, 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 about uh, uh, explains a little bit the confusion that, that comrades have about you know did Mandela betray them, etc., etc., etc. Um, can I have the comrade right at the back? Could this be the last one of this round? Oh, I've got to give you ten minutes to come up. Yeah, no. How many of the questions are you going to take? Quite a few too. Still more. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you be quick, Dawson? Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, right. Two questions. Oh, my, oh sorry. My name's Noel. Um, um, South London SWP. Okay, the first question is, I heard somewhere that um, the reason why Kirk, De Klerk and company released Nelson Mandela is because they realised that a revolutionary situation was about to take place in South Africa and they would lose all their ill-gotten gains. That's the first question. Was that true? The second question, if that was the case, how close was South Africa to revolution at that particular stage in time? Thank you. Um, the comrade right there with the hands up. You, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'd rather not uh, use uh, uh, the mic. Uh, I think you should. Yeah. Can you hear me at the back? Just, just use it. Just use it. I'd like, uh, right, I'd like to thank uh, Ronnie for a very interesting talk. Uh, but there are a number of things that I'd like to disagree with. And one is on the question of consciousness. I visited South Africa last year. And in fact, I, spent, I stayed in a hotel in Santon. And to be honest with you, I made friends, you know, with all the hotel staff. 
And I'll be honest with you, uh, the kind of analysis that they gave of the South African problem is probably the same as Ronnie's, or I would say is even better than Ronnie's, you know, because they are acutely aware, you know, of the class structure of South Africa, you know, the fact, you know, that the, uh, I wouldn't say the ANC betrayed, but the ANC failed to deliver, you know, on its promises. So whether people like it or not, the consciousness is there because this is their lived reality. In some respects, nothing has changed, you know, because all the black workers who work in Johannesburg still come from Soweto. Soweto is a labor camp, you know, that supplies labor to the industries and services of Johannesburg. So they are acutely aware. I think where the problem is, is the lack of an alternative. It's the lack of building an alternative that can get people behind that alternative that is missing in South Africa, not the consciousness. But all the same, I'd like to say to Ronnie, it's good to hear from him because he always has something interesting to say. But on the question of consciousness and on the question of building an alternative, I'd like to say that I sadly disagree with him. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say a big thank you to Ronnie for coming. Uh, he is a massive adornment to Marxism and someone who always uh, brings forward an important analysis for us to listen to. And also, the comrades who come from the London recruits, they're heroes of those who fought apartheid in the 1960s, are massively welcome to this meeting tonight and for the film showing that will come afterwards. Um, I always think when Ronnie speaks, we have far too few ministers of intelligence speaking at Marxism, <laughs> uh, or at least those that we know of. Um, so, uh, I think the point is, though, number one, for all the problems, for all the caveats, the defeat of apartheid was a massive victory for workers in South Africa and across the whole of the world. It was a demonstration that even the most ruthless of states that imprisoned, tortured and hung people and had the most militant, the most developed forms of weaponry could be defeated by people from below. And it's very important to remember that. It showed that our side, and in particular the black working class, could defeat that vile dictatorship. That's one point. The second point is, it's not really about the details of what deal was or was not done. Interesting though that is. The crucial question is, can liberation be achieved in cooperation with capital or only through confrontation with capital? And the problem with the politics of the ANC and the politics of Mandela and the politics of Mbeki and the politics of Ramaphosa is precisely that they believe that social progress is possible through co cooperation with capital rather than confrontation with capital. This is the key dividing line between reformism and revolution. Of course not that total transformation is possible tomorrow, but what is the guiding strategic light through all of that? And the evidence of South Africa is precisely that, that those who seek to make progress through cooperation with the existing powers will end up attacking their own working class. And that's what Marikana is about. Marikana, the shooting down of 34 miners, is precisely about the fact that in the end you line up with the bosses, with the state, with the cops, with those who shoot down workers for daring to stand up and fight for their own rights against the mining houses. That's what Marikana is about, and that's why the election of Ramaphosa is spitting in the face of the miners who died at Marikana. And the only social progress 
is through the forces that are now emerging. And there is actually hope in this because of the fact that the EFF, for all its problems, the economic freedom fighters, is a reflection of a wider mood of questioning about the ANC. Ronnie's refusal to call for a vote for the ANC at the last election was another sign of that. The Numza party is another sign of that. Actually, the fact that Ramaphosa has been forced to raise the question of land reform in South Africa, a central question, 72% of the land is still owned by whites, is a sign of the politics that is emerging. The politics that is emerging in which the question of revolutionary change is posed as an alternative for what exists at the moment. Would you like to come up? Okay, uh, Tim from Norwich, uh, just a couple of questions and then a contribution. And the first question was, in, I guess everyone in the room agrees that in 92 and 94, there are moments in, in, in mass struggles where um, crunch time comes, where you either have to go for, it, for revolution and you have to go to, sm to smash the state and take on the capitalists, as Charlie has said, or you end up trying to do a deal. D do you believe that you could have gone for revolution and actually set up and, and nationalised the economy and actually just gone uh, and taken over, uh, taken over the economy. Do you, do you feel that was possible? Or, or do you feel that you needed a, a revolutionary organisation powerful enough to push that through? And, and my second question is, it's not really about South Africa, but we have Corbynism in Britain, with a mass movement who's joined the Labour Party and hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of people want change, and, and they're genuine, just like uh, the people in South Africa uh, in their millions were fighting, desperately wanted change. Uh, but the same things, that it seems, that happened to you, an experience that you've gone through, ha all have also happened in Greece with Syriza. Syriza tried to take on the system, and they ended up doing a deal and capitulating after huge pressure, and we don't deny that there was huge pressure. Do you feel Corbyn is going to face these same dangers, these same, uh, either the question, as Charlie has said, do you confront capital or do you uh, try and do a deal with it and line up or, or do you get, uh, as you said earlier, uh, hoodwinked into it? And, and I just wanted to finish off with this. I think for those who are, who are not in Socialist Worker, who are here today, um, there are quite a few people like me who have sort of recruitment forms. It's not a crude question. This is the central question for, for all of us, which is, do we confront capitalism or do we try and do a deal? And I think what Ronnie has said, what Charlie has said, and what this discussion today is about is actually we have to go the whole hog. We can't go halfway. We keep doing this time and again. Uh, but, but to go the whole hog, we need a powerful revolutionary party that in that situation that Ronnie has said can actually mobilize the working class and that's what the Bolsheviks built in 1917. That's what we are trying to build today. And, and if you agree with that, then you should come up to one of us at the end and join Socialist Worker. But it's not a crude question. It's a serious question. If you seriously believe that, then you should definitely join. But because we need that. If we are going to crack this, we need a mass party uh, that can mobilise. So thank you. Um, I'm going to take the comrade here. But for the comrades right at the back, please be prepared. I'm going to let you do it at the end. Is that it? Can you hear me? Yeah, um, Stan Keeble. I want to advertise a couple of things. I'm a Corbynite in the Labour Party. Labour Party Marxists is occasional but worth a read. Um, and uh, I want to say that because I'm a Marxist in the Labour Party, doesn't mean to say I don't think we need a Communist Party. The problem is that the left here, comrade asked earlier, what can we do for South Africa? The best thing we can do for South Africa is to make a genuine communist party to unite the left inside and outside Labour in Britain and actually make a revolution here. As it is, we've got 57 varieties, haven't we? And I'm sorry, SWP is one of those uh, groups that doesn't actually constitute the kind of party that we need but it should be a major element. It's got more revolutionaries than the rest of us. That's perfectly true. Um, 
Yeah, that won't, that won't do the trick. The, the problem is the, the, the convergence that we need. We need the comrades in the, in the Communist Party of Britain, my brother's party, and the ones in the SWP here, as well as these comrades in, in what used to be called the Leninist, now the Weekly Worker. And I recommend, uh, Ron, I don't know if you read Peter Manson, the editor writes about South Africa regularly, because he, he, is, uh, uh, he goes there, his wife is South African, and uh, we got a letter there from Terry Bell, your friend. Um, and uh, so that's that. The question and party is tied up with program, right? The fight to make a, a genuine communist party is exactly the same question as the fight to make the right kind of program. The Bolsheviks had a program, and uh, the SWP does not even have a program. This is really funny to talk about a party, uh, a revolutionary party, with no revolutionary program. How do we make it? You know, you make it by the fight for program. The program that uh, Ronnie spoke about was, yeah, I can sum up, was uh, the, the Freedom Charter, I believe is something similar in some ways to the British Road to Socialism, which is a program for national revolution. And it has to be international, that's true. Easier said than done, I know. Uh, there you are. Thank you, comrades. Thank you. Will G. Uh, I was a London recruit, a member of the Young Communist League, went to South Africa illegally in 1981, and then lived in Cape Town for two years, 1983 to 85, undercover. I think part of the problem with many of the contributions, um, including the last one, is a degree of naivety. Somebody asked earlier, well, we had an attempt in Catalonia and you had an attempt in South Africa. They didn't work. Um, why don't you follow us? As if there's been hundreds of revolutions read around the world by the Socialist Workers' Party. Unfortunately, it's challenging. And, and the area I'd really like to explore with Ronnie is the Faustian Pact. I can remember having left South Africa and watching the, what was called the black-on-black -black struggle. If you'd have asked me in 1989, when I went to a rally in Cape Town with tens of thousands of liberated ANC and SACP people, whether they thought in their lifetime, honestly, we were likely to actually have a national revolution and get rid of apartheid without a bloodbath, I'd have said no way. If you'd have asked me in 1992, whether in my lifetime I'd ever actually have seen Mandela as the president, you'd have said no way. So the critical bit for me is that period 92, 93, 94, 95, where as Ronnie told you, he was actually at the heart of it and a deputy minister, quite what was going on in that discussion. Because you talked about we gave away too much and you listed a whole load of shopping list of things we gave away. But somewhere along the line, there was that qualitative step between is this a national revolution where we're in charge and after a period of time, we move it to a more revolutionary stage or whether it was an historic compromise that actually gave away the national revolution. And that two-year period and the discussions that you were involved in and those compromises is the area I'd really like to hear because that's the most likely scenario with something like a Corbyn government at some stage we may be in. Where do we compromise? Do we take the overthrow of apartheid and build on it? Or do we actually go for an armed revolution which probably would have been defeated? And I'd also be interested in your view about the forces at that time. Thank you. Um, we're going to have our last contribution and then we will have an announcement followed behind it. Um, so, right at the back, I apologise if I didn't get to call you. Um, sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Mani Tano. I'm from the SWP sister organisation in, uh, in Ghana. Thank you, uh, Ronnie. It's the first time I've listened to you speak. Of course, I know who you are. I've read uh, a lot of your stuff and read about you as well. And uh, I doubt very much what the last speaker said that it is naive to recall the fact that it is the struggles in the townships, it is the struggles in the formation of trade unions in South Africa, it is the struggles of students and so on and so forth, that brought the stalemate, which gave the space to even the discussion that Ronnie and Mandela and co can have about what tactics to pursue in the negotiation. I doubt very much that it is naive to recall the fact that when Chris Haney died, for example, in 1993, that it was actually the, the, the working class and their mobilization 
which actually saved the country from the kind of fallout that the investments that the apartheid regime had made in sectarian organizations like in Qatar and so on and so forth, the brutal wars in the townships, in the the mining settler compounds and so on and so forth. The only, every time, even for the ANC, even for Mandela, every time that they have managed to make a breakthrough, it has been on the back of workers' struggle. So anyone who claims that what happens in the boardrooms, what happens in the conference chambers, the tactics that is required to, 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 to negotiate the, 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 those deals are, is what we have to look at realistically, realistically, as opposed to counting on the fact that those same struggles that have propelled the, the, uh, the, the, even the ASC up to that moment and have, uh, has opened the opportunity to run into Mandela and so on and so forth, and, that, and those struggles finding their own culmination on the basis of their own self-emancipation, there's nothing naive about that at all. It is naive to consider that we ought to sacrifice the, the, the concentration, or, or, or the focus on seeing that through, than thinking about what other m measures that we can take. What has happened in South Africa today, in terms of the, the things that Charlie talked about, the NUMSAs, the EFF, and so on and so forth, all those are hugely important uh, developments that are taking place. But I think that when you add to that, some of the things that people have referred to, Ron, Ronnie made a, 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 a comment in his, in his introductory remarks about the fact that there is an emergence of identity politics in South Africa. But he also explained that, I mean, himself, by saying that it is the failure and the frustration and the resistance to a failed nationalist agenda prosecuted by the, by the ASC, which has brought about the disaffection. In the same way that you can say that the failure of the Stalinist project in Eastern Europe or the failure of the so-called African Socialist uh, uh, project in many parts of, of Africa brought about some of these things. So for, 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 for us to go back to learn those lessons, for us to ensure that this time, those, those uh, currents that, are, that, that, we're, that, that we're looking to today can, can become the force that actually drives the situation forward, we have to abandon this idea about naivety. We have to abandon the idea that the only way that you cannot be naive is actually to be realistic about how best you organize those tendencies and push them forward. And there will be times that clearly Ronnie will stand with those. He stood with them in the, uh, as he said, in the 200th uh, bicentenary of, of Marx, of the, uh, you know, uh, and those, those events and so on and so forth. But I think also that Ronnie can do a, a bit more than that. Okay? Uh, you know, maybe it may save you a few flights and flu and so on and so forth. But the critical thing really is that it is, it is time that your experience and the experience of all those things culminate in something that actually there can be a breakthrough within the working class. There can be, be a breakthrough in rev revolutionary organization. I think that is a critical factor. And that is the question that Charlie and co have posed. It's the question that you have to help us answer, but it's a question that will be answered without you if you choose not to answer it. And that is the question that some of us are taking from the lessons that you have rich, richly shared with us. It is the question that we ought to take forward, whether in Britain or in Ghana or, or, or wherever else. That is the, any other thing is what is actually the hate. Thank you. Would you like to make that announcement? Oh, should we, do you want to do it now or at the end? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, Jim Nicol, uh, I'm a member of the SWP and for three years I was the lawyer to the 34 families in South Africa uh, whose loved ones were slaughtered by uh, the state. Uh, this is an appeal for Makania, Becky uh, and Jacob and most of you will have seen uh, a leaflet that I handed out uh, um, as you came in. What you need to know is where these three magnificent workers, leaders are coming from. It goes to Maracana. Let me tell you this, that on the night that the 34 were slaughtered, 16 shot in the back, four of them shot in the back of the head. Nearly all of them shop stewards. The remnants of the shop stewards met at the place that they were killed and vowed that they would carry on in honor of their comrades and we would take the spirit of Maracana forward with the slogan that was the slogan of the strike, we strike for a living wage. And at the beginning of January 2014, 80,000 platinum miners went on strike for a living wage and in honor of Maracana. Wherever you saw these strikers, they were carrying the Maracana placards, they were carrying photographs of a man called Manbush, who was the leader of the strike, who was the first to be slaughtered, and who has 14 bullet holes in him. Who are the new people who come forward? The new people who come forward are people like Makania, like Jacob, like Becky. 
God, they're courageous people. I mean, we sit here and dream about it, but I've watched these people. Makanya, a young man in his late 20s at the time, who becomes the chairman of the shop stewards committee at Amplatz, the biggest mining company in South Africa, 30,000 people. You've got to hear this guy. In fact, some of you did hear this guy because he came from Marxism. Absolutely fantastic, together with Jacob and an activist called Becky. It was wonderful to see the strike. My God, mass meetings, 35,000, 25,000, all run, all organized by the union, but behind it and speaking in the meetings are people like Makanya. Makanya I speak about quite a lot because he's what you call a worker intellectual. He's a thinker. He's a reader. He plans. He negotiates. He takes people forward. And that's why he was arrested. He was arrested together with Becky and Jacob during the course of the strike because they were being successful, arrested on fabricated charges of attempted murder, and off they went into prison with the hope that they would decapitate the strike by taking the leadership away, precisely what they did in Maracana by slaughtering the men at the shop stewards committee then. So they spend time uh, in prison. We get them out on bail. Mekania comes here and calls for your support. Marvellous man as he stood here uh, at Marxism. In 2015, I'm in court when the prosecution abandoned this case because they've got absolutely no evidence at all. But, you know, the ruling class, oh, they don't forget. No, 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 no. Vengeance, vengeance, vengeance. So last week, about seven days ago, they're summoned to attend court. They've been recharged with attempted murder, recharged or charged additionally with public violence. And let me tell you, in South Africa, going to prison for a number of years, including life, is not easy. There's no money in South Africa. Let me tell you, there's no money. If you've got 100 people together who are workers and says, tip out your pockets, I'm telling you, you wouldn't get £5 between the whole lot. They've got nothing. They're due in court next Friday. They don't have a lawyer. We need to support them. And so that's why I hand out the leaflet tonight. Now, I've been around a long time, and I know that a lot of people don't carry a lot of cash. That's why I've got the bank details on the bottom. right? So those of you who've got a few, Bob, and really, we have to try and get it. Please send money to the bank. Those of you who want to give me some cash, I'll be standing here. But I tell you, these are magnificent men. These are men with integrity. These are workers' leaders. And we are proud of them. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think that was quite delightful. And I, I'm not patronizing. I love this part of any meeting in terms of the learning process. Because, you know, you get up and speak, and whether it's 30 minutes or 45, and you're dealing with the whole subject, you've got to edit in your mind what to put across and in what sort of time. And it's the responses one gets from several who spoke where I kind of wanted to kick myself for having not gone far enough in an explanation um, to really get to a point which the comrade standing up has, has referred to. So a good example would be the comrade who talked about the consciousness of people uh, in the hotel business or shopkeepers, assistants in Santon and places like that, and the high level of political awareness. And I really concede that's absolutely the case. South Africa is a very politicized country. Everybody has a view. The point, comrade, that I'm trying to make about the levels of consciousness now and the height of, I would say, the revolutionary movement, which was in that period of the late 80s and then the extraordinary breakthrough into 1990, etc., that Charlie Kimber has referred to in, in a, a very rousing way, is basically the vast difference between then, when we had such a possibility to go far further in confrontation with the ruling class and the international backers that we did, then we did, and the kind of level of consciousness now, albeit that the comrade is correct and 
everybody you talk to knows quite clearly the ANC has failed, they gave away too much, and so on. And you get this from very young people and old people and workers and, and the unemployed and rural people. The other aspect that the comrade referred to was, you know, the alternative. That's, that's what's required. That clarity and everybody else, in a way, coalesces and brings that together in one form or another, which is the main thing I'll go and try and deal with uh, in a moment. So since that's going to be my main input, in which I hope to bring together a lot of the aspects of a dozen or so of the inputs, just let me deal with a few things that in a way are outside of that, although connected. The one was the point that was made very early on by the young woman, uh, and I say young woman, um, who, who said, well, the moment things started going awry and you, you weren't really achieving things, uh, why didn't you go back to the grassroots? Of course that was a question for a number of us, whether we were ministers or deputies or officials of the ANC or the Communist Party or, or ordinary members. And there was a lot of soul-searching in relation to it. And I bet you this is what you would have in Syriza, what you would have here in Britain, and we, we know this from the whole history of the Labour Party, let alone the, 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 the latter period of Tony Blair. Whether you stick with a movement that is speaking for most of the people at a particular point, that has a socialist orientation, which Labour had, and which again is coming to the fore under, under Corbyn, whether you're facing up to the issues in Spain or elsewhere, Latin America, I mean, all over the world, it's all rather similar. And you don't have a pure Bolshevik party, Socialist Workers' Party, Communist Party. Uh, everybody's grappling these days. It's not so clear as it might have been in the past, certainly for Africa. For Africa, it's not as clear as it was at the height of the national liberation struggles of the 60s through to the 70s, where you had the breakthroughs in Zimbabwe, in Mozambique and Angola, Guinea-Bissau, and then later Namibia and South Africa. Uh, and there, there was a clarity in terms of the international movement and a clarity within those countries themselves. And you know, in a sense, and I hate doing this, going back to the Bolshevik Revolution and debates about what was going on in the Duma, but given the centenaries we've had and the rereading, you're only giving me five minutes to deal with all that. Okay, I'm going to try. Uh, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the presentation was just so good. But, you know, one thing that does ring in my head, rereading all of the polemics, Trotsky and Stalin and Zinoviev and everybody else, Lenin, um, there you have the breakthrough in February and you get the revolutionaries are now moving into the Duma. And really, until Lenin's on the scene, and right through to July, what is the argument? Those Bolsheviks are saying we should go along with Kerensky. And it's a majority of them that this is a way forward. And it's Lenin who starts looking into that and analyzing. And as you all well know, by October, it's virtually Lenin alone who says, this is the time now to strike and challenge and go for broke. We've got it now at this particular moment. Everything hangs on a thread. All that political judgment that's required. And that whole Bolshevik party, including the extraordinary Trotsky, who comes to the fore in a magnificent way in terms of organizing, helping to organize the actual insurrection and then later the Red Army, um, are, are diffident about this. And 
Think, think of that. And think of what you face here in Britain in terms of <coughs> the question about Corbyn <coughs> or the way you might look at the Spanish Podemo or the Syriza issue, or will G and others, how we, we in South Africa, I mean the closest I've really come in my life to the questions we're talking about here as a central player was that period in South Africa where suddenly the damn wall was broken and there we were on the cusp of power and the question very seriously, not in terms of sellouts or people who were faint-hearted, etc., but who were looking at an issue, and why I like Tarek's quote, is the question of the dialectic of partial conquest, where in that interview he says, well, we were discussing what people in history always discuss, and that is, are we strong enough now are the masses with us now? Is the revolutionary situation at such a point now that we can challenge and confront? Or are we wrong? Will we be beaten back and vanquished in an adventuristic decision and lose it all? Or do we hang on now in terms of this partial advance, which was stupendous in South Africa. We never really, I can tell you, as an article of faith, we said apartheid won't last and we'll come to power. I don't think in our wildest dreams we ever imagined we'd be where we were in 1990 to 94, and we could actually debate this. And then it was a real, genuine question. Comrades, do we now stand up? Have we got the guns? Is MK strong enough? Are we going to manage to challenge them and push through and go for broke? So you can come with points, and I, I say this respectfully to the comrade who came forward, big burly comrade, and said, no, don't you think it was your wrong theories on CST, colonial of special type, two stages, etc. You know, we can debate that until the cows come home. And I want to tell you, we in the Communist Party never said it had to be two special stages. We always said they were interrelated, the national aspect of the struggle and the class. But that's, that actually becomes very hypothetical, I, I believe. I would say, comrades, in all due respect, we did not fail because we had a CST and a two-stage theory. We had what we're discussing, what Charlie Kemba put across, Wolgi, and so many others. When do you decide? Corbyn, now, I can understand him having to walk a tightrope and take very careful decisions. There was a comrade who came forward and reminded us of Naomi Klein and the question that she raised, which we must never underestimate, and we underestimated it in South Africa. It's the power of international capital. We can defeat them, and as Charlie showed, we did in South Africa break through the wall. But for goodness sake, don't think that they are puny, that they are inexperienced. They have a far far greater insight into the power gain than I believe we ever really have had, but you know, I have a long way to go. Okay, this is summing up, so how, how much for summing up? So, so comrades, I beg of you that we have to be so modest internally and with each other as we have to be frank and open and not shirk from any embarrassing questions or accusations. Try, and I, I must say, everybody was wonderful. Thank you for being kind to me. No one was personal. There were quite a few who raised really sharp questions sometimes, and I listened to them. Do, am I really right in what I want to say? We have to learn the dialogue between ourselves. If we are going to create, which we must 
in Britain, in South Africa, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, throughout Europe and North America, Russia, the lot. If we to regain what we had lost to such a degree to corporate international finance capital that had come to the ascendancy and it's now barbarism or socialism, the stakes are so high. And to help each other, how to help people in South Africa, we've been given a practical example by Jim Nickel in relation to helping the miners there who are standing strike, but uh, who are standing against this, the, these charges. But the key thing is to learn from each other and create this internationalist understanding and community of socialists and to know that none of us have got the monopoly or the total answer. And I know Communist Party people here who I greatly respect, SWP and others. And I'm really impressed at what happens at the school, for instance, this festival. It's a great example. We have to come together and build, which is the challenge in South Africa, which I hope earnestly and for the last remaining days that I'm able to breathe, um, give my all to helping to create that alternative which I believe South Africa needs to the control of capital which goes back for hundreds of years. And it's a strong control. And of course Ramaphosa, and I don't believe the ANC, which is basically a nationalist organization or movement. It, you need a revolutionary socialist movement. And where there are strong national movements, you need to try and find a way of, of getting into alliances on the basis of principle. But of course socialists must lead the way and it must be based on class analysis and understanding, taking into account identity issues, gender, sexual orientation, obviously the key, a key question of color division, which is a product of class-based societies, in order to come together and build what we're trying to do now in South Africa. And just let me say, finally, Comrade Chair, that it has taken some time, as the comrade said, well, what's happening with this new Socialist Workers Revolutionary Party? It is coming to the fore, and uh, one has to accept that comrades need to do it in their own particular time. I am one of those who breathes down the necks of the likes of Zuel and Zima Vavi of the New Federation um, and, and, and comrade Jim of, of NUMSA because time is going by and we do need that revolutionary party in South Africa if we're going to link with our masses and of course raise the level of consciousness which needs to be raised. But comrades, that alone is, is not going to make the revolution. You know, scientific analysis, Marxism shows you, my last sentence, comrade chair, that we need to understand the conditions, the objective conditions. It's not just the, 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 the uh, subjective conditions. And revolution comes about when you have both the objective and the subjective conditions. And of course you work to develop and mature those objective conditions. You don't just sit back and you do that through struggle on all fronts. And this is what I believe the future holds for us. And it's a great challenge for us all, which is why <coughs> I will continue to take a flight here when I'm called upon to do so, even though I know I'll need to come at least a week before in order to recover from the inevitable cold that I'll always pick up on a blasted aeroplane. Thank you.